So um, I wanted to start with just a brief outline of, of the presentation I have for you today. Um, so I want to give um, general background on honeybee hygiene. I know you're experienced beekeeper, so I won't dwell on that too much. Um, but I want to tell you why I think hygiene is the most sustainable option for uh, varroa control. Um, and a, kind of an overarching theme, something I'll come back to um, a few times in the talk, is um, not all hygiene is created equal. We tend to think of hygiene as one behavior, um, but there are lots of different selection methods. And I, I want to make the point that hygiene, um, there are lots of different types of hygiene, and not, not all hygiene is the same. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about UBO. Some of you may be familiar with it, um, but I'll tell you what it is and some characteristics of high UBO colonies. And then I'll talk a little bit about how UBO works. Um, I want to talk about uh, heritability of hygiene um, through UBO selection, um, environmental effects on UBO tests, and some of the biological mechanisms behind UBO um, that we're starting to, to understand and unravel. I'll tell you why I think this work is important, um, where we plan to go from here, and then we should have time for questions at the end. So I was building this presentation and um, I wanted a new fresh picture of honeybees cleaning. And so I did, I just popped it into Google honeybee cleaning um, images. And this is the, a screenshot of what popped up. And what struck me about this was I realized these are all cleaning services. And, and what struck me was that honeybees have actually a, um, a reputation for cleanliness. Um, and despite this reputation for being so hygienic, for being so clean, um, we still have all of these health issues. So this is a survey from uh, the Be Informed Partnership here in the U.S. Um, from 2022 and 2023. Um, and it just shows us that regardless of um, what size operation folks are running, backyard, uh, sideline, or commercial, um, the number one self-reported cause of colony loss um, uh, for across these different operation sizes was consistently Varroa. And so um, what I was hoping to do is really take this um, issue that we're facing uh, globally, um, pretty much, of Varroa and address it with this um, kind of the reason honeybees have this reputation for cleanliness. And of course, I'm talking about hygienic behavior. Um, so here I'll show a, a video of hygiene. And if you keep an eye here on the middle of the screen, um, you'll see them pull out uh, a brood. But hygiene is, of course, this ability to detect, uncap, and remove unhealthy brood from the colony. Um, and I do believe that it's the most promising and most sustainable option for controlling not only varroa, um, but also disease in the, in the honeybee colony. We can compare uh, hygiene to other common ways of dealing with varroa. So we have miticides, organic acids, and mechanical interventions. Um, miticides, we know they can work, but we also know that they can contaminate hive products and that over time, mites will evolve resistance. So you have when you're using chemicals um, to kill insects um, or, or much of anything, you have this constant arms race where, um, you know, those few survivors are the ones that go on to pass their genes and those are the ones that are resistant. So you're always having to come up with a new chemical um, because, you know, or, or rotate the chemicals around your apiaries and their use around your apiaries. Um, and so... Um, with hygiene, you don't have to worry about that. With organic acids, we also know these can work, um, but they can be temperature dependent, um, depending on which ones you use. They can be tough on queens, they can be tough on brood. Um, and then we have mechanical interventions, um, things like drone removal um, or queen caging. And these can also work, um, but they can be very labor intensive. So here I put a picture of a tired beekeeper because um, beekeeper Keepers have enough to do, I would say, um, especially um, you guys, I think you have a longer brood season than we do. Um, so you don't even get the off, off season like we do, but um, beekeeping is a lot of work. And so these mechanical interventions um, can be useful, but they can be labor intensive. 
So with hygiene, uh, the mites don't have the opportunity to evolve resistance. This is something that's been along, uh, around a long time in honeybee colonies and even um, in other social, social insect colonies. Um, it's not tough on queens, and it's really only tough on those uh, unhealthy brood, those brood that you want it to be tough on. Um, and then it doesn't have to be labor intensive. So unfortunately, um, breeding, selecting for hygiene can be a bit labor intensive. But once you get that trait in your bees, it's actually the bees that are doing the work, not the beekeeper. Um, and that's, I think, really important and really the goal that we that we want to get to, the place we want to get to, that the bees are taking care of their own health and their own well-being as much as possible. And we really have less intervention needed as the beekeeper. The other thing I really like about hygiene is that it's preventative rather than reactive, at least at the colony level. Um, so here in the spring, um, we have these hygienic bees already finding those uh, early foundress mites, um, pulling them out of the colonies. Um, what happens if um, you are relying on things like miticides and waiting until you hit a certain threshold to treat your colonies? Um, you may have that threshold of varroa reach 3%, you treat, you knock those varroa down. Um, but what's already happened is that the viruses have already spread, uh, started to spread through your colony. So it's really great if we can prevent the problem rather than treat it after it's already established. So not all hygiene is created equal. Um, we've known for some time, um, several decades, that um, that hygiene can be effective against things like chalk brood or American fowl brood. Um, but we have kind of mixed results in terms of hygienic behavior and um, varroa mite resistance. Um, but just take a look at the difference between those that we know hygiene works with and those that we don't. So chalk brood and American fowl brood, we have um, dead larvae. And this is really different than what you have with uh, varroa infestation. You have a living, pupae, a living larvae that's uh, maybe unhealthy, um, but is not dead. And I think that's one of the biggest differences. So we have done some studies comparing uh, UBO and freeze kill brood selected colonies um, or, or how colonies uh, perform on these two tests. So this is uh, from a study that's published and available open source. If you're interested, you can check it out and learn more. Um, but what we did is we took uh, 72 colonies, we followed them, we tested them with UBO and freeze-killed brood uh, assays, and what we found is that they are significantly uh, positively correlated. So what that means, if you score high on one test, you're more likely to score high on the other. But it wasn't a, a really tight correlation. This is not the same test as freeze-killed brood. Um, and when we look at those kind of different possible scenarios of how uh, colonies could score, so they could score high on both uh, assays, low on both assays, or high on one and low on the other, what we saw was the colonies that scored high on the UBO test, regardless of how they scored on the freeze-kill brood test, had the lowest uh, August varroa infestations. So these are positively correlated, these two tests. They're related, there's overlap, but they're not the same. Um, we've also run some comparisons between UBO and uh, the Harbo test. Again, we found they're positively correlated. So if they score high on Harbo, if you're getting a three or four uh, with the Harbo test, which is of course um, going in and looking at mite reproduction and, and number of reproductive mites in the brood cells, um, if you're scoring high on those Harbo tests, um, you're more likely to score high on UBO, and that's clear. Um, but again, the tests are not, not the same, and we don't actually have Varroa on these uh, colonies yet, um, but we're hoping to get some Varroa counts um, this year from, from this breeder. Um, but what we found is those colonies that scored kind of medium to high on UBO scored high on the Harbo test. Again, a lot of overlap, but they're not the same. Um, so these are all three different selection methods to achieve hygiene, but they're not the same as each other. And I will say that, that um, UBO is really a, a pretty hard test to pass. Now, um, I have this chart that I actually put together for a, a funding proposal that I wrote a while back. 
Um, don't feel like you have to memorize it. Some of these may be arguable points. But the, the point I want to make is, you know, I've talked about a few, but there's several different selection methods um, to achieve hygienic behavior, and none of these is perfect. They all have their pros, they all have their cons. Um, and so you have to find out what's right for you, what's right for your operation. Um, traditionally, we've seen that there's a trade-off between uh, the accuracy and efficiency um, of some of these methods. So for example, the HARBO or SMR test is really pretty highly accurate at, um, at selecting for varroa resistance, but it, it kind of takes a, a, um, a lot of time to perform. You have to have some special equipment if you're using microscopes, um, and you have to have some, uh, some knowledge of how to do the test um, that's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, in comparison with the freeze kill brood, I think this is an easier test to do. It doesn't take as long, um, but you also don't quite get the same uh, level of, of accuracy in predicting a colony's uh, varroa resistance using freeze kill brood assays um, or, or pen kill, which I think is pretty comparable. Um, so in developing this UBO technology, um, what I was really going for was eliminating this trade-off. I really wanted to, to find a way um, to very accurately predict your colony's varroa resistance or measure the varroa resistance of your colony, um, but to have something that I could do um, 40, 50 um, assays um, a day by myself in the field. Um, and, and, um, and so that's that's what I've tried to achieve is kind of eliminating that trade-off. Okay, so I've referred to UBO. Now I want to get into a little bit of um, what it is and what it can do. Um, so UBO originally came from the term unhealthy brood odors. Um, and so there's kind of a lot of background information that I'm going to skip over here. Um, I've done some talks on YouTube that are recorded and I'm sure are still out there in cyberland somewhere. Um, if you want to kind of hear the backstory, these are also open access um, publications if you want to, to read about it. Um, but I want to summarize this so we can get to the more exciting part. Um, UBOs, what we found is that um, there are these certain compounds that are elevated in varroa parasitized and virus infected brood. Um, and we found that these are different from the compounds that are released by dead brood. Uh, or these necromones. So previous studies had showed that there, um, there are death pheromones released with, for example, freeze-killed brood, things like oleic acid or beta-osamine that are released um, when brood is dead. And we found that these compounds um, are different from those dead brood compounds. And not only that, um, they can be detected by nurse bees and they are uh, triggers of hygienic behavior. So we wanted to know, you know, this was kind of like fundamental science stuff. When I started this, I was had no thoughts of a tool um, for beekeepers. I was really just asking the question, what are the chemicals on the brood that, that hygienic bees are, are finding? Um, but once we had this finding, we, we thought, well, how can we use this information? How can we make it useful to beekeepers? And so we asked, can these UBOs actually be used to measure varroa and disease resistance? And so we spent um, this gray statement here represents about four years of my life, but again, boring stuff we're gonna skip over, but we made a mixture of lab synthesized UBOs. So we got some chemists to make these uh, compounds. Uh, we figured out a mixture of them that kind of emulates what's happening naturally in, in the colony. Um, and we call this mixture the unhealthy brood odor assay, this test. And so I want to just tell you kind of how it's applied, and then we'll get a little bit more into to what you can do with it. Um, so we have developed a, a spray gun. This is actually a, um, originally a cattle vaccinator gun that we've modified to, to work with uh, the UBO spray. Um, and so we have a little vial of uh, the UBO mixture here um, that you can pop onto the, the applicator. You spray a, a small area of capped brood cells. Um, they can be really any age up until a, a few days of emerging. Um, so you want them younger than that. You spray on the pheromones. There's usually about um, 45 or 50 capped cells in the brood area, um, in the, the test area. 
Um, we use a little PVC pipe uh, ring to kind of mark the area. Um, you put that test frame back into the colony for two hours, pull it out, and then um, you're going to quantify uh, the manipulation of those cell caps. Um, so you count the, the number of cell caps that are capped initially and then how many are still capped at the end, and that gives you your UBO score. Um, and what's really important is the next step. So um, that's pretty much all it is for the test, but uh, the important part is what you, the beekeepers um, and the breeders do next. So you can take that information and make informed decisions about breeding and uh, about apiary management with those UBO results. So I wanna show you what it looks like in real life. Um, on the left side, I'll show you a high UBO response and on the right side, a low UBO response. Um, you spray the, the pheromones on at time zero and then at time two, you pull out the, the frame and you can see something like this. You can see there's still two cells here um, that are uh, capped. So this was not a perfect 100, but we got a 96% here. Um, this colony had seven cells uncapped, so it got a 24%. Um, so this would be categorized as high and low. Um, and this colony should be pest and disease resistant. So what would I do uh, with this colony? I would um, limit treatment. I um, would, would not plan to treat this colony unless um, for some reason I saw that it needed it, but um, very unlikely. Um, I'm going to be grafting eggs from this, splitting it. You could potentially sell this as a breeder queen. Um, if I see a colony like this on the right, um, I'm going to expect if I want her to survive, this colony to survive over winter, I'm going to need to um, probably treat. I'm definitely going to monitor carefully. Um, in my apiaries, I'm always trying to build up the UBO uh, scores, so I'm going to remove any drone comb, uh, try to get uh, this queen's drones out there. Um, and I may consider requeening this colony. Um, so what you would do with UBO um, really depends on your goals, your operation. Um, and I kind of want to make the point that um, UBO is not like this silver bullet. It's not going to solve all of the problems. Um, but I think it is a really useful tool. And, and I want it to be something that, um, that beekeepers can use to kind of sculpt the queens that they want to be varroa resistant um, with also all of the other traits that they value most. So I think it's really important in your pursuit of varroa resistance and, and pest resistance and disease resistance, not to um, forego the other important traits in your colonies. So make sure that um, if you're selecting for hygienic behavior or using any tool really, um, make sure that you're keeping your bees gentle, you're keeping the, the honey production up, all of those other things that are important. Um, and then from those really good colonies, um, you can select for those that are, that are most hygienic. Um, and I do think beekeepers are really innovative. So I'm already seeing here in the States, um, uh, and actually some in Australia as well, um, beekeepers are using UBO in different ways to select for different traits. Um, so after two hours, sometimes we see complete removal. Um, sometimes we see partial removal. We can see complete uncapping without any removal. Um, and sometimes we see partial uncapping, uh, no removal, and more of these like smaller pinhole type uh, uncappings. And so um, I think this is a really versatile tool. I already have some people selecting uh, for the uncapping without any removal. Some people prefer this um, kind of more hyper hygienic um, response of uh, complete removal. And so I'm really interested to see kind of where these breeding strategies take us. Um, and I'm sure, you know, as innovative and uh, creative as beekeepers are, we're going to have some really neat results. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's other ways people are using it that I'm, I'm not even aware yet. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we've seen in terms of the characteristics of high UBO colonies. And I just want to start by defining what it means to be high UBO. Um, and so for, for these purposes, I've included anything from a, a small uncapping uh, you know, something big enough for an antenna to fit into, 
um, to complete removal as a, as a positive response. Um, and this is this graph is again from that um, that field trial we ran with 72 colonies. And so here we have a single UBO test run in June. So that's kind of like early summer for us. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have August varroa infestation. So this is kind of when our varroa infestations are peaking towards the end of the summer. Um, and what we noticed, uh, each of these points here on the graph is a colony. What we noticed is that those colonies that scored 60% or above on the UBO test really were able to keep their varroa levels down. Um, and so that's kind of where we got this high and low um, differential. So here I have broken the, the same data set that I just showed you into colonies that scored high on UBO and colonies that scored low on UBO. These are all untreated colonies, so they've not received any varroa treatments. And we found that those colonies that scored 60% or above um, could really maintain low varroa levels, an average of 1.6 uh, varroa per 100 bees. Um, compared to 7.2% infestation in the low UBO colonies. Um, what was really exciting about this uh, for me is that typically we recommend treatment at 2% or 3% infestation um, in the fall. And so what this meant is that this tool can really help us distinguish the colonies that likely need treatment from those that likely don't. Um, we took those same colonies and we tested them with freeze kill brood. Um, freeze kill brood typically you use a 95% uh, removal over 24 hours as your high and low th threshold. Um, and so we did see with the high freeze kill brood uh, assays, those that scored high on the freeze kill brood assay had significantly lower varroa than those that scored low. Um, but we just weren't able to separate. Um, the, the really resistant and non-resistant colonies, um, especially above and below that economic treatment threshold, as well with freeze kill brood as we, we did with the UBO. Um, we also looked at winter survival, and um, what we found is that the high UBO colonies had a 41% greater chance of survival um, than the low UBO colonies. Um, again, kind of mirroring that Varroa data that I just showed you, the high freeze kill brood colonies also had a greater chance of survival, um, but it just didn't separate out quite as neatly as with the UBO. Um, we've also looked at virus loads. Um, we found that high UBO colonies have significantly lower virus loads than the low UBO colonies. So here I show um, six uh, viruses that we looked at. Um, the, the virus load in uh, blue is for the low UBO colonies, and in orange is for the high UBO colonies. Um, so really some pretty significant differences in, in virus levels between the high and low UBO colonies. And what was exciting here is we found um, some differences not only in those viruses that were transmitted by Varroa, but also some viruses that are not known to be transmitted by Varroa. And I think that just kind of goes back to um, the name of the tool, Unhealthy Brooder. This is useful for identifying Varroa-resistant colonies. Um, but unhealthy brood odors are not specific to Varroa. They're, they're not coming from the Varroa. They're actually a signal sent out by unhealthy brood. It essentially seems to be a stress signal. Um, and I think there's some other really nice data out there that supports this. They've actually found one of our unhealthy brood odors um, in ants that are targeted for um, what they call unpacking in ant colonies. That's essentially the same as uh, hygienic behavior in honeybees. Um, and so this is really evolutionarily, I think, goes back a while. Um, this is a way of uh, signaling for social insects, uh, for signaling that, that there's a problem um, and, and potentially being an altruistic signal saying, sacrifice me, there's an issue. Um, I wanted to show you another um, kind of relationship between viruses and UBO score. So I've kind of simplified things by saying high and low, high and low. Um, but really, when we look at these uh, UBO scores versus uh, here's deformed wing virus A and deformed wing virus B, um, you can see that it's pretty continuous scale. So the higher the UBO score gets, uh, the lowest 
lower the virus level. Um, so I just want to make that point. You know, we've kind of added a medium category to our way of thinking, um, but really, you know, a, a 55 is not the same as a, a 10 in terms of being, being low. Um, the, the higher you get on the UVO score, it does seem to, to make a difference in terms of how um, viral resistant a colony is and how, um, how virus resistant as well. So for me, one of the really exciting things over the last couple of years is um, I've been able to get this tool out to collaborators. So I spent a long time developing it, um, playing around with it in my apiary. And finally, I've been able to, to pass it along and show it to other people. And I'm starting to get data back now from them. Um, so this is from uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Ismail Amiri at, the, at Mississippi State University. And he found this past year that um, high UBO colonies not only have bees with lower virus loads, but also the mites in those colonies have lower virus loads. Um, this is just preliminary data. So we're going to follow up on this. Um, we're still running the statistical analyses, um, but but was really an exciting finding. Um, and we have some ideas of why this may be. Um, we'd also like to, to follow up with those. It could be that these highly hygienic colonies, these high UBO colonies have younger mites that have lower virus loads. You know, they just are more likely to get targeted the longer they live, um, targeted for removal. So they tend to be younger with lower uh, virus loads. It could be also um, that these high UBO colonies specifically target high virus mites. Um, and that makes sense to me if those mites are passing more virus to the brood, uh, they're causing more damage to the brood, and then the brood is uh, potentially sending a, a stronger stress signal out. Um, these options aren't mutually exclusive. We don't know yet, um, but we do hope to look into that further. I've also done some work with um, the University of Vermont. Aunt, Dr. Samantha Algier um, and some of her students. Um, they had some really neat findings um, from last year. They're following up on this year. They found that um, the prevalence or the number of colonies with nosema did not differ for high and low colony, high and low UBO colonies. Um, so, so high and low UBO colonies had the same number uh, roughly of uh, infected colonies. Um, but when they looked at the loads of nosema in those colonies, what they found um, was that the, the low UBO colonies, especially in August, really had significantly more nosema um, than the high UBO colonies, which had a much lower level. Um, and, and that was a really interesting finding, especially because nosema is not a brood disease. Um, and so we were a little bit surprised by this. And um, Sydney Miller, one of uh, some Dr. Algier's students, is following up to, to kind of learn more about why this may be. Um, we think maybe their immune systems are stronger, these high UBO colonies, um, because they don't have all the viruses, they're just better able to fight off nosema. Um, it could also be um, that they're, they're targeted. We just, we, we don't know. Um, exactly what's going on, but um, we look forward to finding out, and Sydney's doing some really neat experiments to, to try and tackle that. Um, I have been working with Corinne Jordan uh, for the last couple of years. Um, she's a breeder at Bee Lady Apiaries and through Bee Genetics in Queensland, um, and Cor Corinne sent me this data from her first year of testing, um, and what she showed was that um, there really is also a significant correlation between um, colony UBO response and uh, chalk brood mummies. So the, the higher UBO response colonies really have um, much less chalk brood. Um, I wanted to share this experiment. This is one that um, I'm way overdue in publishing. I did it, I think, four years ago now, and it's been on my to-do list for a while. Um, but I want to share kind of the, the setup of the experiment because it was really fun to do. Um, we ran a classical Pavlovian conditioning experiment. So if you remember um, back from maybe high school biology or middle school biology, um, Pavlov noticed when, his, when he fed his dog his dog's dinner, um, the dog would salivate. And so Pavlov uh, would ring a bell. 
um, when he fed the dog its dinner, and what he noticed was that he could get the dog to salivate in response to the ringing bell without ever having any food present. So essentially, he made an association between the bell and the food um, to get a response. And we wanted to do that same type of thing with honeybees. Um, and we used something called the proboscis extension reflex to do this. Um, so what that is, is if a strong enough solution of sugar water touches the antenna of a bee, um, they will stick out their proboscis. This is a reflex that they can't um, really make a choice about. It just happens. Um, and so we can use that to associate um, UBO smell with a sucrose reward, just like Pavlov uh, associated the ringing of the bell with uh, dinner. And so the way we did that, we had these bees strapped into tiny drinking straws. Um, and so I took glass capillaries and I treated just the tip of the glass capillary with some UBOs. Um, I would touch that to the antenna of the bee. And then I would put sugar water on the antenna. She would stick out her tongue, her proboscis, and then I would give her the sugar reward. Um, and so the reason this is nice is because we can... Um, then use these bees to study learning and to study memory. Um, so essentially what would happen is eventually we could touch the glass capillary to the antenna and she would stick out her proboscis. Um, so we never needed, we then didn't need the sugar reward anymore because she had learned the association between these unhealthy brood odors and the sugar reward. Um, and so then we could study how quickly she learned and how long she remembered that association. We found that um, a colony, uh, the, the colony that the bee came from, uh, their UBO score really had no effect on how quickly the bees could learn or their short-term memory. So we found that they could, after about four conditioning trials, the bees could distinguish our UBOs from some control chemicals. So they essentially learned at the same speed, regardless of where, where they came from. They remembered the same amount when we tested them two hours later. But when we went back and tested their, their memory of that association 24 hours later, um, the bees from high UBO colonies had a better memory of those UBO. Uh, compounds. So um, just a really neat experiment, I think, to show um, that these uh, high UBO colonies have better long-term memory. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, heritability. Um, so I ran an experiment last year. I wanted to test how heritable uh, behavior was. I set up a high UBO apiary with an average score of 85% and a low UBO apiary about eight kilometers away. Neither one of these was isolated from other bees. I can't do that where I live, um, but they were very drone saturated apiaries. And then from each of several colonies at both locations, I made two sister splits and then just moved one of those daughter splits to the other yard for mating. Um, and so what this gave me was four types of daughter nukes, um, kind of all of the possible combinations between mother's hygiene and mating apiary. So for example, they could uh, come from a low hygienic mother and mate, the daughter mated in the low mating apiary. Um, they could come from a higher low uh, mother's hygiene and mate in the higher low mating apiary or the ideal scenario, they came from the high UBO mother, um, the eggs from the high UBO mother, and then the daughter made it in the high UBO apiary. Um, we then waited a bit and UBO tested the daughters. And so I wanna show you what we found. Um, at seven weeks post queen emergence, um, this is the emergence of that daughter queen, um, we found um, here I have the high maternal UBO, so we found that the, the mother's uh, UBO score seemed to have the biggest impact on the outcome of the daughter. Um, here we have the low maternal UBO. Um, but what I want to point out is um, the mating apiary in both cases did seem to have an impact. Um, so if they made it in the high, here shown here in green and here in red, if they made it in the high UBO apiary um, and they came from the same maternal uh, origin, they had uh, a higher UBO outcome. 
Um, we tested also at six weeks. You can see the variability. We still have the same pattern here, um, but the variability was really high at six weeks. Um, at seven weeks, it goes down. And then we tested um, when they were much older, somewhere between 10 and 14 weeks, um, and we saw really uh, much lower variability. Um, we did find, though, um, the average daughter score when they were um, from that low mating apiary was 15% lower uh, than the mother. Um, in the best of both worlds, so high hygienic mother, um, high mating apiary, we still saw that the average daughter score was 9% lower than the mother. So there were um, plenty of daughters that equaled the mother, that were higher than the mother, um, but on average, they are, are losing this trait. And so you really do have to actively select for hygiene. Um, we showed through this experiment that UBO is a heritable trait, um, but consistent with previous studies of hygiene, um, it does seem to be uh, a recessive trait. So you, you have to work to, to find it and to keep it in your population. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about UBO in the environment. Um, so um, we've seen some variability um, in UBO tests for the same colony, and so we're really trying to understand a little bit about um, how environment can affect UBO response. So one of the first things we wanted to look at was colony size, um, and we um, ran a, a large study looking at many different colonies. Um, we counted um, frames of brood and looked at um, uh, the relationship between the UBO scores, and we saw absolutely um, no effect. And we've done this again since, and and still no effect. And this was really important to look at. Um, you know, some some people worry, well, if they're taking out sick brood, aren't you going to lose um, some of your uh, population size? Well, when you end up with healthier bees that live longer, um, that does not seem to be the case. Um, but this was important, not only because we want to make sure when we have high UBO colonies that we have large, um, very productive colonies, um, but it also is important because uh, you may want to test and compare a nuke in your apiary to uh, a double deep in your apiary. Um, and we showed that you can uh, do that and reliably, uh, you can trust the results um, of that comparison. Um, I also looked at bottom board type. So I liked screen bottom boards, um, but we also have lots of solid bottom boards in our equipment. And so we just ran tests between those two and we saw there's no effect um, of these on, on UBO score. You know, my thought was maybe the ventilation affects the smells of the test, but we really saw no effect. Um, we know from some past experiments of hygiene that nectar flow can impact hygienic scores. Um, and so we ran some UBO tests in June during a natural nectar flow. Um, we divided the colonies into two equal groups um, with roughly the same UBO scores, so an average of 60, an average of 57. Um, and then we took those two groups of colonies and we retested them during the August dearth. Um, one of those groups we fed one-to-one -one sugar water and the other we left unfed. And we saw, I think, that um, there is a clear seasonal effect, so it's best to test during a, a natural nectar flow. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot of flow, but um, like it doesn't have to be the big heavy honey flow, um, but you need to have something consistently coming in. Um, if you have to test in a dearth, you're going to see um, lower scores overall, um, but you can rejuvenate those a little bit by feeding one-to-one. -one. Um, so, so we still have a lot to learn, I think, about this relationship between nectar flow, um, but we do see some effect. There's also a study um, from way back in 1995 that shows that smoke reduces uh, the responsiveness of honeybee antenna for 10 to 20 minutes. Um, totally reasonable and fine if you're just trying to chill your bees out because they're being a little feisty and you're um, trying to inspect your colony. But if you're running a smell-based pheromone test that only goes two hours, this could be a problem, right? So we wanted to see um, how the smoker use may affect uh, hygienic results. And we did, in fact, find um, that there was a change in UBO scores, a, a slight decrease in UBO scores with use of a smoker. Now, we were really puffing smoke into the frame right where they were testing 
Um, so I think the, the effect may be minimal, but we do recommend to avoid uh, use of a smoker if possible during testing. Um, okay, UBO biological mechanisms. How does UBO work? We know that UBO um, triggers the hygienic response of adults, um, but how are these UBO, UBOs detected? And so we're trying to understand a little bit about the, the biology behind this. We know, of course, the antenna are involved in this uh, process of detection. Um, and we also know that antenna hold uh, these, uh, or contain these odorant binding proteins. In Apis mellifera, uh, there are 21 different odorant binding proteins in the antenna. And the function of these uh, proteins is to bind and transport molecules on the surface of the antenna to receptors. And some previous work has um, shown us that there are two odorant binding proteins, number 16 and 18, that are more highly expressed in freeze-kill brood selected bees. Um, and we also know that these specific odorant binding proteins, 16 and 18, can bind those necromones we talked about earlier, those death pheromones like oleic acid. So we ran a study, this was a collaboration with Leonard Foster in Canada. Um, we ran a study, um, kind of a preliminary test to see you know, what we think with these high UBO colonies, we'll see similar results. We'll have higher expression of that odor and binding protein 16 and 18. Well, it turned out we were wrong. We saw actually the opposite. So bees from the high UBO colonies actually had lower amounts, lower expression of that odorant binding protein number 16. But they had higher expression of a different odorant binding protein. So again, this kind of reiterates um, what I was saying before, UBO and freeze kill brood, they're similar, but they're not the same. And I think this actually really makes sense if you think about it. With UBO, it's a different compound, so it makes sense that there's a different protein that's going to bind those uh, different molecules. And we got funding to follow up on this uh, this year, um, so I'll be collecting samples here in the next few months. Um, we're going to try to compare uh, UBO responders, freeze kill brood responders, and also um, high and low HARBO colonies. Uh, harbo tested colonies and really get a better sense of what's going on uh, mechanistically in the antenna to uh, be able to identify these um, these compounds. So as an overview, I've shown you um, a ton of information, a ton of data here, um, but to kind of summarize what we've been through, um, high UBO colonies have lower varroa infestations, um, they have higher overwintering survival, they have higher freeze kill brood and harbo scores. Again, not the same, but uh, definitely a lot of overlap. They have lower virus loads, lower chalk brood and nosema loads. They have higher or better long-term memory of that uh, UBO um, sucrose reward association. Um, and UBO is heritable. They have uh, higher uh, scoring daughter queens if they come from a high UBO mother. Um, we have some preliminary data related to odor and binding proteins. Um, I also, I didn't have time to show it here, but we have a data set that showed a relationship between cell recapping uh, and UBO scores. It's only from uh, a small study, so I put it kind of in the preliminary section. Um, and then we have uh, some evidence that um, mites in these high UBO colonies also have lower virus loads. Um, we haven't done any studies with foul brood yet. Um, we don't have data with tropolalaps yet. We don't even know, I think, enough biologically about tropolalaps um, to know if hygiene is effective against them, but we are going to run some tests in Korea this coming year um, with UBO and a couple other um, selection methods as well to see if uh, colonies that have... Um, lower tropolalapse numbers have higher hygiene. Um, and so why is this important? Um, I think, you know, UBO in a lot of ways kind of democratizes um, the breeding and, and also verification of uh, queen quality. Um, so I like to show this image um, because this just compares a couple of different um, uh, apiaries that have been 
analyzed using UBO. So here we have a VSH breeder stock um, from someone who's been breeding colonies uh, for VSH behavior for over a decade. Um, this apiary was um, someone who essentially took breeder stock and made uh, splits off of them, daughters off of them. Um, we have the standard commercial stock in the U.S., um, which is really um, not very hygienic at all. Um, these commercial guys typically are really heavily reliant on uh, miticide use, um, and so we don't see great hygiene numbers in these commercial stock. Um, and this is um, Varroa Naive uh, Australian stock from the first year of testing. Um, and so you can see, um, you know, it, when, when you're thinking of Australian stock and where you are in terms of hygiene, there's really a long way to go um, to achieve resistance. Um, but thanks to the work with Corinne Jordan, I think we're on our way. Um, so here I have shown, um, this is some data that Corinne just showed, showed me or sent me um, this past week. Um, and so here we have, um, in just a, a short time, um, made some improvements. It is slow. So here in the blue line, I'm showing the average UBO score over um, four generations. So from the first test um, to the third generation, the F3 generation, um, we are approaching an average of 20% uh, UBO. Um, and I want to highlight that this is a, a preliminary data set, this F3. There were not very many um, colonies in this F3 generation. We've only been doing this for um, a year and a half now, I think. Um, but we did reach this past year 50% um, of the colonies that were tested scored over 20%. Um, and so I do think it's, it's promising. I think there's a long way to go, especially if I understand correctly, you're not able to at least easily import uh, varroa resistant stock to kind of start yourself um, with a little bit higher scores. Um, but I do think that, that we've made progress pretty quickly and will continue, continue to do so. So that's exciting. Um, I think UBO is important because it, it facilitates local hygiene selection. And I don't know how relevant snow is to you in Australia, um, but I put this picture here because um, I'm from the south. Uh, we didn't get snow the last two years. Sometimes we get a little. But I work with folks up in Vermont that, um, you know, get a ton of snow, have really cold winters. Um, and they really wanted to select for hygiene in their colonies. Um, but all of the breeders uh, tend to be in the south, the rural resistance breeders. And so they would bring in these hygienic queens from the south, and then they would end up sacrificing the, the winter tolerance that was locally important for their bees. So one thing I really like about UBO and having it in the hands of uh, lots of breeders, lots of beekeepers, is that um, you can kind of find out what traits are important to you, um, what's important to your stock, what's local, what your stock, your honeybee stock is locally adapted for. And then within that stock that's already got the other traits that you value and you find important, um, you can start selecting for varroa resistance, disease resistance within that stock and build up um, your resistance that way without sacrificing those other important traits. Um, UBO also can inform management, so I think this is um, more important for, for larger um, organizations and larger entities, um, but you can ID potentially susceptible colonies um, to treat. Um, you know, I like to have a really high UBO apiary where I keep all my high UBO colonies. Um, the survival rate's great every winter. I never have to treat those colonies. Um, it just kind of helps me streamline the management. Then I have a low UBO apiary, or maybe I have some colonies that I like for other reasons, um, but they don't pass UBO tests, um, and I know I probably have to treat those. Um, UBO, I think, can boost industry sustainability because um, here I think we can um, we can really achieve something that can help us uh, reduce our reliance on those treatments um, that we know eventually the mites will become resistant to. 
Um, it also, you know, ultimately the goal here is to improve honeybee health and survival. Um, so that's, you know, really the, the underlining uh, reason um, that I've been working with UBO and, and why I think it's important is I want to improve honeybee health um, and, and their survival over winter. Um, and it goes a little bit beyond honeybees too. Um, I think we have the potential here to decrease the spread of pathogens and parasites to other pollinators. So a study from 2020 showed um, that bee pathogens were found in 42% of bee and 70% of flower species. Now we know that honeybees share um, floral resources with native pollinators. Um, we also know that there's spillover that occurs from the honeybee colonies into native populations. Um, and so I think as beekeepers, we have a responsibility to keep the honeybees healthy, um, not only for their own sake, um, but for the sake of, of native pollinators uh, nearby. And I think we have the potential by controlling honeybee diseases uh, to benefit native bee health. Um, moving forward, there's a lot more to come. Um, I'm hoping to start identifying the UBO thresholds needed for specific diseases. So I showed you Corinne Jordan's chalk brood data earlier. Um, this line here corresponds to about 20%. So it seems that you actually need only a UBO score of about 20% um, to be relatively chalk brood resistant. Um, and so I think that makes sense. Like I showed you before, those chalk brood larvae are dead. Um, so they're easier to detect by, by sensitive bees, um, but it makes sense to me that each disease will have its own kind of threshold, so we can learn more about that. And then if you want to deal with nosema or you want to deal with varroa or chalk brood, uh, depending on what you want to deal with, you know how high you need to get your UBO scores. Um, there's a lot more to do in terms of understanding environmental variables. Um, folks have been studying hygiene for a while and, and have seen over and over that the hygiene scores can be variable even within the same colony. And so the more we know about what affects uh, hygiene, uh, the more we'll know about how to control for those differences. Um, we've started on this uh, journey and I've only really, this just scratches at the surface of the variability. Uh, measuring behavior is quite difficult, um, but we have lots of plans to, to keep following up with these um, and learning more about hygiene and the biology of hygiene. Um, we have plans to work with the odor and binding proteins, tropolay labs, do some studies with native bees uh, around high UBO and low UBO apiaries. Um, I've had an idea for a grooming assay um, that would be both really cheap and really fast. Um, so I got some funding to test that out. I have no idea if it'll work yet, um, but I'm really excited about trying that and, and starting to develop an, a new uh, technology there. Um, and really most of my time uh, this past two years has been focused on getting UBO out of the lab, out of my hands and into the hands of beekeepers. Um, and, and I'm hoping to make it available to Australian beekeepers soon. Um, I do not have a distributor yet in Australia. So if anybody's interested or knows someone has a recommendation, please let me know. Um, but I am hoping to get it there um, as quickly as possible. I know it's a, a big area of need. Um, with that, I'd like to um, thank the many brilliant minds and hardworking hands that um, played a part in this research. It was certainly not done by me alone. Lots of people have been involved. Um, I've had lots of funders from small local uh, beekeeper clubs that saw value in our work all the way to uh, federal funding organizations. And of course, my university, uh, University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Um, so lots of folks to thank. Um, and I did just wanna put my website and my email address up here. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and we have a lot more information on the website, opterabees.com. Um, I also have links to um, most of my uh, papers, are, although they're also, um, the, the publications are also available through a quick Google Scholar search. Um, and if you are interested in UBO testing, um, we do have a UBO testers, uh, group on Facebook where folks get on and, and chat and share their experiences and questions and successes. 
Um, so I, I recommend you to check that out. Thank you very and much. I will stop there.